One of the many elements of candor that I appreciated from Kyle Dubas' introductory press conference was that he just blurted out, plain and simple, that the bottom six really, really needs some work, if not a complete blow up. Good morning to you. Good Wednesday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Penguins. It comes your way bright and early every weekday. If you're into football and or baseball, I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Pirates where you found this. The Stanley Cup Final resumes tomorrow night in Sunrise, Florida with Game 3. The Panthers still looking for their first win and the first sign that they're going to make my prediction look something other than outright embarrassing. I have the Panthers in six, so I'm still alive, (laughs) although I don't know how it's going to go. If, and particularly if, Sergei Bobrovsky doesn't get it all together in a big, big hurry. The Penguins' bottom six was probably the subject matter of this show to one degree or another, maybe, what, 75% of the time? That's how it felt. That's how it felt over this past NHL season. I couldn't get over the concept of a general manager watching that bottom six night after night after night and never thinking to himself, at least not that we know of, man, that could that could really use an upgrade because there's just not much going on down there on that ice rink when those guys go over the boards. They were terrible. They were terrible. As a group, as a collective, however it was that you wanted to mix and match them, they were terrible. They were this team's principal shortcoming. So when Dubas says that they like what they have in their top six, they love the, you know, obviously the experience and history and everything involved and Sidney Crosby, Evgeny Malkin, if memory serves Dubas further, identified by name, Jake Gensel, Brian Rust, Ricard Raquel, Jason Zucker, who's about to be an unrestricted free agent, didn't have his name come up. That can just be coincidence. He's speaking live. He's not reading from a script. I wouldn't parse too much into that, but I would. I would most definitely pay attention When the guy who just came on the job says, but this bottom six is something that needs work. I look at the Penguins' bottom six, and I do it in a great big hurry. And I come to two conclusions. One, Drew O'Connor shouldn't even be in the bottom six. He should be in the top six. And here's hoping that among the first assessments that Dubas makes, will be exactly that. If they weren't convinced by what they saw, whether it was in person on Mike Sullivan's part or on video with Dubas's part and through analytics, what he did in Pittsburgh, here's hoping they paid attention to him in Finland just now because he was outstanding for the United States in the world championships. He continued to show that there is more to his game than just a big body who can skate around, than just a big four checker. He can be a guy who contributes offensively. And even if he isn't, you as an organization owe it to yourself to find that out firsthand, not after the fact. There is no way you can ever give up on O'Connor, whether that's allowing him to go somewhere else at some point, or even internally, without saying, hey, we we gave him a shot up there. We let him do some things. We gave him 40, 50 games. I don't know what would be a fair number exactly. And look, it just didn't work out. It didn't work out. But when we put him back on a line, a third line that was grinding and this and that, he seemed like himself again. That's an acceptable litmus test, if you want to call it that. My second observation when it comes to the bottom six is a lot more stark. I really don't care. I really don't care if any of these guys come back. The only one 
who I could see the Penguins maybe taking some kind of flyer on, and that would be provided he passes a battery of medical tests, is Ryan Paling. Paling's only 24 years old. He was a first-round pick in Montreal. He's got all kinds of pedigree still. You remember some of the goals that he scored. I mean, they were there were only seven, but a couple of them were just spectacular. That if this guy were ever to get his injury issue in order, and I'm telling you here on this show that I believe it's a back problem. That's the reason it's so on and so off. Everything that I'd heard from being around the team, uh, in particular one game where he was a late scratch, is that it's a back. And and those, if you've had one, you know what I'm talking about. One day you can feel like a million bucks, the next day it's, well, it's back. Here's hoping for everyone's sake that he checks out okay and that the Penguins consider keeping him. Beyond that, without even getting into my usual Jeff Carter spiel and and all that other stuff, I look at Josh Archibald and Danton Heinen and, wow, I'm having trouble even coming up with names at this point, and I was only around them all year long. I, I don't care. I don't care. What this team needs in the bottom six is buzzsaw level energy. It needs some physicality. It needs some size. It needs some speed. And I know I'm just daydreaming here. But I do believe that any good GM begins with at least a notion of what it is that they want, ideally in harmony with the head coach. I don't believe that Sullivan had a whole heck of a lot to do with some of these guys who were added. Certainly not. Oh, geez. I, I, there, there's another I left out. I mean, Kyle Granlund. I mean, you just got to buy him out. This is a blow up. That's what this is. This is a blow up. And you know what? That's what it deserves. When we come back, J1Q. This segment of Daily Shots brought to you by Family Table. Mom-inspired, chef-prepared meals delivered straight to your door. No prep, no mess, just reheat. That gives you more time for your family or hobbies. Go to FamilyTablePGH.com. Use the code DK40, that's DK40, for 40% off and free delivery on your first order. Order by noon Thursday for Monday delivery. Family Table, bringing families back to the dinner table. Today's J1Q comes from Adam, who says, DK, it really seems that Brian Burke kind of retired on the job here. I'm not a fan of the old school hockey dinosaurs in general, but especially when they reach the point where they're just looking for what's essentially a career severance check. DK, you made a point this week that I've been screaming about for months. Burke did not need to micromanage Ron Hextall on every move, but he should have been helping create a vision, or at the very least not allowing moves that would handcuff the team even further. Did he even care enough to do that? Well, Adam, no, he didn't. Burke had established between him and Hextall this almost hockey player like Bond, where they were just going to do everything in concert. And that went to the extreme. And I remember describing this to you guys, or those of you who've been listening to this show for a while, especially on road trips, because they were very visible on the road. They'd both go on most trips. And they'd show up for the morning skate in lockstep, walk to the same part of the arena, sit there together, and stare at these guys skating in circles. And then the various Chad Ruweedles and so forth would come on, or stay on, I should say, after the skate. And they'd, they'd watch that too. Usually, not always, but usually. And I remember thinking to myself, it is nice for a team to have their executives around. 
Uh, there's a level of accountability that comes with it. All the players are aware of where they're sitting and, and all that other stuff. And it gives off, to borrow your term there, uh, that old school vibe. You know, we're here to make sure you guys are da 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 There's no other reason for them to be there. There's nothing that they're studying. There's nothing that they're analyzing. There's nothing that they're becoming more aware of. Okay? Nothing. Zero. I just happen to feel like they got too close. They became buddies, and there was going to be that bond there, and they were going to have each other's backs. Not once did this man, who became known more than anything in his hockey life for his bombast, for being that guy who just says all the most daring things, not once did he utter a peep of negativity about anything related to a player that had been acquired, to a move that had been made. And I'm I'm not being dumb here. I'm not expecting that the president of hockey operations should meet with me or some other reporter and say, by the way, hey, Got to tell you, DK, Hextall really blew it with that Granlin trade. I mean, I told him. I told him. Don't go after Granlin, buddy. He, listen, he, he just didn't listen. He went and got him. That's never going to happen, okay? And it shouldn't happen in that type of structure. But there should be some kind of, the, well, a check and balance. That's what he's there for. That's what he was there for. He was supposed to be that guy who prevented it. The example I gave in the episode that you just referenced was that he could have just gotten on a horn with anybody. He could have just, I don't know, he could have done a search on, I don't know, what's some old search engine so I can say something funny here? Lycos, okay? He could do a Lycos search on Granland and his stats, and maybe even dig up a, a couple of advanced analytics pieces that would take about eight seconds and say, hey, Hexy, uh, Ixnay on the uh, Randland, yay. You know, you just can't, you can't, you can't just say, my GM said it, and I'm standing behind him. That's nothing. That's doing nothing. So, yes, maybe it was a great big severance check. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everyone listening to Daily Shot of Penguins. We will do another one of these tomorrow. 